the sun is rising on another day on Earth. From 93 million miles away in space, the vast nuclear reactor that is the sun is sending out almost unimaginable energy towards our planet. This power and the water that covers nearly three quarters of the Earth together make our weather. Together, sun and water create a daily drama of staggering proportions. A weather drama of fire and rain that makes our life on Earth possible and which daily both gives life and destroys. For those who have once met the full power of weather face to face, life will never be the same again. You're so much at the mercy of the weather, it's the fear, I think, just the overwhelming, all-encompassing fear. There was this force, this sort of a, a primeval force uh, lurking in the mist. Mother Nature every now and then rears up and lets you know who's in charge and you think that you're in charge of your environment and, and you're not. It is mysterious, and it does these things with unimaginable power, and unimaginable fury. It's truly awesome. We think of our weather as benign, as something we can take for granted. But up in the atmosphere, there's a system at work of quite extraordinary strength and savagery. The power of this hurricane, if it could be harnessed for one day, could light and heat the United States for six months. These lightning bolts burn hotter than the surface of the sun. Heavy rain can turn a wet road into a foaming river that will sweep away a car and the people in it. whirlwinds that have claimed 20,000 lives this century. In moments, weather can turn our lives upside down and take away our sense of security forever. This series goes in pursuit of the most severe weather life forms that inhabit our ever-changing sky. From the mountain with the worst weather in the world to the coldest village on Earth. From the boiling summer heat of India to the storm chasers of America's lethal tornado alley. In these savage skies, we will find that each different weather species has its own appetite, its own lifestyle and habitat, and its own secrets. Over a weather year in the English market town of Stowe-on-the-Wold, the weather is affecting these people's lives every moment of every day. What they wear and what they eat, how they move around, even how happy they may feel. The weather affects our moods, our jobs, and our country's economies. It makes us what we are. Yet most of us care so little about how and why it happens. When weather disasters strike, it's as if they come at us out of an empty sky.
As the skin is to an apple, so the atmosphere is to Earth. All our weather, from clouds to tempestuous gales, is packed into this shallow band of atmosphere. We can travel thousands of miles across the surface of the Earth, but lifting off into space, we climb just six miles before reaching the outer edge of the weather's sky. A commercial jet at its cruising height is looking down on the space the weather lives in. For the people of Stowe on the world, as for people everywhere, it's only the weather over their own heads that concerns them. But their small fragment of sky is part of an unbroken weather chain stretching around the world without beginning or end. A vast interconnected system that ties us all together, from Stowe to Siberia, from Buffalo to Bombay. It's March the 22nd on the equator in Brazil. If there is a beginning, this is it. The sun, the first link in the unbreakable weather chain. The sun is almost exactly overhead. It's driving a process that will bring us all the weather we know. The Earth is a water planet. Water covers three quarters of its surface. It's even suspended in the air, just visible in the sticky heat of the Amazonian rainforest. The sun's heat is constantly transforming this moisture into invisible water vapor that rises high into the air and turns, as it cools, into billowing clouds. When the droplets in the clouds collide, they become too big and heavy. They fall to earth again as rain. Over 4,000 million years before man, the first rain fell. And still it falls. The same water endlessly rising as invisible water vapor and falling again as rain, neither more nor less, day after day, since time began. This rain, tumbling in the Amazon today, might once have flowed through Imperial Rome or slaked the thirst of a dinosaur. Sun and water combining in perpetual motion, the ever-changing dancing of the clouds making visible the basic chemistry of the skies. Yeah, just a little bit on the, in other words, on the, we're looking sort of... Few uh, people in the world appreciate there, the magic of clouds the way this Canadian the couple do. To Ed and Jereen Verkaik, the clouds are a kind of signature. Weather's fingerprint on the sky. Yeah, we have a couple of moments here. An accident in his 20s has left Ed with partial sight, but he still sees what few people even look for. He and Jereen are world-renowned weather photographers sky chasers in endless pursuit of the perfect photograph. Today, they're in the Arizona desert. The desert is a dry place. However, the air around us is full of moisture. You're in an invisible form, water vapor. Right now, the droplets are too tiny to notice anything. If you condense them, squeeze them together, make them grow a little bit larger, they form cloud particles. They become visible because they're reflecting light at you. And therefore, when you look at a cloud, it's white, you're really looking at just light that's bouncing back at you from all those little particles that are sitting around up there. It's like the mysteries of the atmosphere all being unfolded and laid bare before us, you know. What a storm that was. We never did get close to that, but from a distance, what a beauty. See all those uh, ruffled edges, all the layers of updrafts this spreading sort of like out? Previous uh, stages of the storm did that? That's right. You're looking back in time, all the way to the outer edge, which was probably several hours ago. Yeah. Oh, you remember this one? This is the first picture that we took on the first trip we took together. Yes. I just love that high, high, feathery cirrus with the Q, the cumulus right down near the ground in juxtaposition. That's gorgeous. What a contrast between the two levels, eh? the top and the bottom of the atmosphere there. It's between those very high cirrus plumes and those very low cumulus puffs sitting there against that. It's beautiful too. 
Oh, remember that alto cumulus lenticularis? The yes. fine, fine ripples. I just couldn't believe that that kind of detail could be in such a patch of cloud. I didn't see that originally. And then you pointed out that it had all those uh, tiny little notches and, and uh, uh, almost like teeth marks along the edge. Teeth marks. You and your teeth marks. <laughs> God's fingerprint, but not teeth marks. Like a fingerprint, every sky is unique. The combination of sun and moisture making shapes that will never be repeated. High up, rippling wind making cloud patterns like those the sea leaves on the sand. Cold air making mist in the valley that will melt away as the sun warms it. Look closely and the sky gives up its secrets. Moving clouds showing the way the wind is blowing, different directions at different heights. Cumulus clouds, whose birth, life and death may take just a few short minutes. It would need a million of these cloud droplets to join together to make one single raindrop. These shredded streamers are ice clouds. It's falling ice crystals that make their delicate trailing streaks. 135. Okay, good. Every cloud has its favorite habitat. Like some rare animal, this cloud is only found in one part of the world. The morning glory. Only seen in eastern Australia in the early morning, before the sun burns it away. These hovering lenticular clouds only form near mountains, where they have been mistaken for flying saucers. There's nothing static about sky at all. There's so much happening up there all the time. It's constantly changing and surprising you. For me personally, the weather is something that drives my, my love of nature, my, my sense of uh, uh, renewal from day to day, and um, uh, my appreciation of the beauty that's around us, the mysteries that surround us. Of all the clouds, the most mysterious, the most majestic, the king of the sky, is the all-powerful Thunderhead. Fueled by the heat of the sun, this cloud contains the power of a nuclear bomb. The water suspended within it has taken a unique form. It is icy cold, minus 40 degrees, but unfrozen. These are clouds of liquid ice. At the thundercloud's core, hailstones are made. Held aloft by 90 mile an hour winds, they grow layer upon frozen layer of ice until they are spat from the storm. Some grow so big they can shatter car windscreens, kill livestock, even take lives. Farmers call it the white plague. This one lost $45,000 in minutes. We kept watching the cloud and it kept getting closer and closer and, and had a greenish gray color to it and so we knew it was pretty sure there was hail in it. And then it started real small hail and real, quite a time in between it just kind of would hit plink plink and then, then it started just unloading. The leaves, of course, were stripping off the trees, just like uh, the sky had opened up and the wind was driving it. It knocked every window out of the house, and the hail was driving into the house from the force of the wind. Swollen by its cargo of some 500,000 tons of water, a thunderhead can even break into the stratosphere, reaching 10 miles into the sky. It's a dangerous place to be, as climber Jerry Gore found out, on a rock face two miles up, inside the exploding heart of a thundercloud. We were right on the highest point. This was a culmination, and this is what it was all about. Great feeling of euphoria. 
suddenly tinged though with fear because um, as I was taking the summit shot of Warren, there was this very loud bang and actually a flare of, of, of lightning. Suddenly we realised we were right in the middle of an electrical storm. Thick mist, snow, um, driving winds and this, this lightning everywhere. It was like someone opening the door on you and there was the storm waiting for you behind this door. It was like an evil force and it was all pervading. There were bullets of lightning hitting the ground. We could see them because of the little red flashes. We could smell them because of the, um, the smell of burning in the air and they were literally just splashing all around us. Suddenly, bang. It was like being sledgehammered right in the middle of the back, but the, the actual force seemed to cover the whole body. I just smelt and, and almost tasted fear. Maybe it was death, I don't know, but it was something evil, it was something very tangible. I did actually jump out of my skin because I felt this out-of-body experience and I felt myself coming outside myself and it was this loud ringing in my ears, there was this whole feeling of being hit, of being struck, of being blown up. But a thundercloud's powers are not all to be measured in pyrotechnics. It has a deadlier weapon still and it is invisible. A cold wind crashing down out of the cloud, strong enough to knock a plane out of the sky. A microburst. Pilots and air traffic controllers know microbursts only too well. Since 1970, they have been the biggest single cause of plane crashes in the United States. If a plane is caught by one on takeoff or landing, it's unlikely to survive. In the summer of 1988, Denver Airport was chosen for a research project aimed at studying and filming these deadly downdrafts. It was important to discover just how common these invisible killers are. And the scientists got a shock. We had no idea what to expect. We thought, oh, maybe we'd see 20 or 30 of the things over a period of three or four months. And the last time anybody bothered to count, we counted up about 186. So they're pretty common. As the scientists filmed this microburst, an aircraft coming into land was caught in it. They could only watch in horror. The image stays with me to this day because the airplane got quite low, well short of the runway and I saw the nose come up and the airplane continued to sink. And I thought the airplane got quite close to the ground and I asked the controller there, because they watch these things a lot more than I do, how close he thought it got. And he said within 50 feet. It kept me awake for quite a couple of nights thinking about what could have been. The problems that pilots face is without any foreknowledge that what's there and how strong it is, they have no idea of knowing what's to come. A pilot's natural inclination is to do all the wrong things. Dallas, Texas, April 1985. 105 people died when this plane was caught in a microburst as it was about to land. Hey, instruments cross-checked. Uh, we're VFR landing and now, pilots can learn from the disasters of the past. This pilot flies a computer program taken from the black box of the Dallas plane. Wind shear, wind shear, wind 400 shear. descending. Go around thrust, please. Go around thrust. 300 descending. 250 descending. 300 level. 250 descending. 300, climbing, 200, descending, 250, climbing, 350, climbing. Looks like we're out of that, Bernie. It is mysterious. Here's this stuff that comes from water vapor, and it does 
these things with unimaginable power. I certainly don't enjoy the damage that it does, the people that it hurts, the airplanes that it crashes. But it's a bit like nature unveiled. And to think that it comes from thin air is one of the most astonishing things of all. Thin air and a little bit of water vapor and some sunlight. And that's, that's what makes it go. It's truly awe-inspiring. Rain, falling every day all over the planet. Each raindrop formed like a pearl around a speck of airborne dirt, a grain of sea salt, so that rain, as it falls, cleans the skies. Moisture sucked up by the sun and falling again as rain, the essential cycle of life on Earth. But when thunderclouds burst, quite incredible quantities of water can fall. In less than an hour of torrential rain, a quiet river can turn into a flash flood, the weather's biggest killer. Yesterday, Linmouth was a peaceful holiday resort. Today, it is a ruin. In August 1952, a flash flood swept away the heart of this Devon village. Three months' worth of rain had fallen in a single day. As dusk fell, a wall of water 40 feet high roared down through the village, hurling trees with the force of battering rams. On a sunny summer afternoon, it's hard to imagine that Linmouth could ever be threatened by its two picturesque rivers. In 1952, it was packed with visitors, as it is today. There was almost nothing to prepare them for what was to come. I thought it was quite an eerie experience. It was a gunpowdery colour of sky, you know. Something that made you feel you had to go home. The southern wall of water came down. Colossal amount of water. It made the ground tremble as the rocks thundered down the river. We rushed outside the shop. As we got outside, we were washed onto these railings with this wave of water which was, came down way steep. You could hear the rocks rolling all round and people calling out, screaming out. You could hear the houses crashing, you know. Repeated flashes of lightning uh, lit up the scene. And in a flash of lightning, you could see that there were different colored layers of vapor above the water ranging from dark brown near the water up to a light yellow and beyond above. And there was this, this strong smell, not an unpleasant smell, one of wet earth rather than slimy mud, you know? I was then in the main stream of the water. The telephone kiosk alongside me went over as well. And it floated with the air still inside it, so I grabbed hold of the telephone kiosk and went down the road with the telephone kiosk. And as I got near back towards where my, my wife was, hanging onto these railings, I was calling out to her. I saw deep freeze floating by, and I heard Norman calling me. And I put out my hand to where the voice came from, and he grabbed it. She virtually saved my life, really. More water flowed down through Linmouth that night than normally flows down the Thames in three months. Above the tremendous din, you could even hear screams of one family in particular, a whole family that went with their house. I saw these two ladies, they were clinging onto the bridge in a sea of water. I thought myself, well, I've had it this time, but they most certainly have. Unfortunately, they were washed down the river. They went out to sea. They were lost. We'd look out the window, and all of a sudden, we'd see these shafts of light beams go up into the air and then sort of go murky and go out. It was the cars being washed away and it was where the lights, the water made the contact for the lights for a short while and the headlights came on and then eventually. 34 people died that night. 
the youngest a baby just 13 weeks old. Flash floods are so destructive because rain is so heavy. Flood water flowing at 20 miles per hour is not four, but 16 times more powerful than water flowing at five miles per hour. Flash floods kill hundreds every year. Half of them in cars they think will save them. Just two feet of water can rip a car from the road and send it swirling away. Flash floods hit without warning. For thunderclouds can make huge quantities of rain in a terrifyingly short time. One hot July Saturday in 1976, these clouds grew to twice the height of normal clouds in less than one hour. Then they dropped 10 inches of rain on the Big Thompson River Basin in Colorado. Downstream, it wasn't even raining. Even in winter, the Big Thompson is only a trickle. But within its ice is locked the 20-year memory of a community and its sense of disbelief. Uh, the sheriff had called me and said we had had reports that the Big Thompson River, they had some flooding up above. And that kind of surprised me because uh, I told him, I said, well, we were just at the river and it's at its normal level. It's six inches deep and crystal clear. So I got my flashlight and walked over to the edge of the river and looked down at this little creek and all I saw was a torrent of water. It looked like the waves crashing in the ocean. They were just huge and there was these propane tanks, and they were just like they were corks flipping down the river. They had whistle and sing and gurgle when they would go underneath the water, and all this was washing up, and it was washing over against that part of the mountain there, too, and slamming back up like a big, big wave coming back. It wasn't water, it was like boiling lava. A car would appear in a bubble come up to the surface with the lights on. You would see uh, people waving and flashing lights and windows roll down and screaming for help. And then the car would disappear in the next roll of water. The Nicholson family lived here, Barbara and Howard and five young children. Howard took 10-year-old Christy to help an elderly neighbor, Mrs. Bailey. This is how forceful the water was. Her dress, there was almost nothing left of her dress. And so I, I remember going up to her and trying to pull down what little was left of her dress. And this is what is just really weird because it's like I turned and turned back and they were gone. They were gone. Their neighbors, Bob and Beverly Graham, only realized something was wrong when they saw a bridge come crashing past their house on a wave of water. They hurried to get their two little girls to safety away from the river. As we were going out the back door, another tremendous surge of water came by. It's the surge that carried away my wife and daughters. I barely made it to the house and I could no longer see any of my family. I saw some boulders the, the size of trucks rolling in, in the water end over end, and there was no stopping them. I mean, they just continued to roll. Pieces of houses, uh, vehicles, cars and pickups, uh, travel trailers washing by. Some of, some of the cars still had their lights on. One or two of them, I saw people in them trying to, to ride it out, but they were being tumbled about in these, in these surges. As the sun rose the following morning, the people of the canyon saw what the rain had done. 418 homes had been completely destroyed. 52 businesses had been wiped out. 35 and a half million dollars worth of damage had been done. To give you an idea of the force of the water that could emulsify a vehicle, that's what it did. They would just find piles of twisted metal and not even be able to identify a vehicle. As soon as it got light, the whole family walked down the highway, walked together to see if the house was still here. And then when we saw that it wasn't, we just saw it. 
And that's the first time I see, I've seen my father cry. I just stood there with this, you know, devastating. As the days went by, 139 bodies were pulled from the wreckage. The flood had treated them cruelly. Many were so badly battered, they were unrecognizable. Among the dead, Bob Graham's wife, Beverly, and his two-year-old daughter, Lisa. And of his nine-year-old daughter, Teresa, no trace has ever been found. As we grow up, we, we kind of take it for granted that our parents will get old and die before us, but it is pretty uncommon for you to lose your children and to lose them very suddenly, and that's the, the toughest thing to deal with. And I've talked to other people who have done the same as I, and they too feel handicapped. Only way I know how to describe it. You, you realize and, and just how powerless a human is against the forces of Mother Nature if she decides to do something this drastic. And yes, you end up with a very deep respect for nature and its forces. It's June, and in India, everyone is waiting for the monsoon rain. Rain that will come not as a freak, but as proof of the climate's reliable rhythm. Since March, the sun has moved north of the equator, and now it is scorching India. With temperatures reaching 120 degrees, dozens have died from heat stroke. At Victoria Terminus, Bombay's main railway station, the rush hour is about to begin. Two and a half million rail commuters crowd into the city centre at the beginning of another sweltering day. The packed trains are stiflingly hot. Temperatures outside are in the high 90s. In these conditions, even busy commuters will stop to queue, just for a drink of water. Now it's uh, scorching heat. It's very hot. Mosam bahut bekar hai. Garmi kiti par rahi. There is an anxiety in their hearts, in their eyes. They are looking towards the sky, and this is a common topic everywhere. Wherever you are talking to each other, oh, today is it's very hot. Oh, the other man always will say, oh, the rains are going to come fast. It is the sun's heat that will bring the rains. But this year they are late, and people are beginning to wonder if they will fail. Along Chalpati Beach, anxious faces scan the sea for signs of rain. The entire city is waiting for news that the monsoon has broken over Kerala, the southern tip of India. Only then will it begin its steady progress northwards, bringing cooling rain to Bombay. One woman has particular reason for worrying whenever the rains are late. In the factory she runs, every window is thrown open to catch the slightest breeze. For the workers of Ibrahim Karim and Sons, this is the busiest time of year. As they have done for 120 years, skillful fingers are snipping and stitching, assembling and testing umbrellas. Ours is the oldest and leading uh, and the largest umbrella business. So we've been called Chhatriwalas to the nation, the umbrella, the umbrella walas to the nation. There have been times when the rains have not come till the third week of June. And that's when we have really worried, you know. Five million Bombayites await the monsoon with more mixed feelings. They will shelter from the rain in flimsy shanties like these. This street is Jula Maidan. No fans or air conditioning here. No running water either. Every precious bucket of water must be begged or bought and carried home.
Every day the rains are delayed. Obtaining water becomes more difficult for the shanty dwellers of Jula Maidan. But the monsoon will bring enormous problems too. Outside number 39, Samina and her mother-in-law sell homemade food from a handcart. Just as the smoldering wood drives the flies from the food, so the monsoon will drive away their business. अरे पानी भरता है कभी ज़्यादा ये घुटना भर भरता है पानी भर कभी ज़्यादा और गिरता है तो और ज़्यादा भरते ही जाता है पानी नहीं बरसात तो दुआ मंगते हैं बरसात आगे तब दुआ मंगते हैं बंद हो जाए नहीं बरसात बारिश गिरता है तो जगह जगह पे आजान होती है हम लोग के जमात में जैसा होता है ना व for the forecasters too, these are tense days. The northern limit of the rains is advancing, but how quickly? Three times a day, the telexes reveal the monsoon's progress. In the scorched weather office garden, an observer dutifully checks the rain gauge. But it requires information from around the world to forecast the monsoon. The heat of Bombay is just one link in a weather chain that stretches from Brazil to Tibet. The depth of snow in the Himalayas, the temperature of the Pacific Ocean can both affect its behavior. But for the Bombayites, the only question is when. I think it's uh, within eight days. Within four days, the rain must come because you yourself must be feeling it has never been so hot as it is now. अब ये कोई अल्लाह का वो नहीं है कि कब बरसने लगे हो। अब इतने हम लोगों को मालूम होता कब गिरे बारिश तो फिर क्या था? ये कोई को मालूम है कि कब बरसात होगा? The monsoon has been called the world's biggest sea breeze. The sun heats the air here so violently that it can rise more than thirty thousand feet high. Wet winds sweep in off the sea to fill the gap and spill their moisture as rain. Bombay's fishermen see it first as high churning seas, dirtied by a wind blowing strongly from the southwest. It's time to get the boats in. There will be no more fishing until the sun, moving south again in September, takes the rains back with it towards the equator. Mrs. Kareem, Chatriwala to the Indian nation, has seen the signs too. 15 days ahead of the monsoon, I can see the sea changing, the sky changing, and then the strong waves come and they dash against the sea wall. We have an office in Calicut, and um, our chap, our manager in Cal Calicut, always phones us. And he phoned us yesterday and said that the monsoons have broken in Kerala. So that would mean about eight, 10 days. So we have this good signal. As dusk falls, people gather to cool off on Chaupati Beach. A whole continent waiting and praying for rain. When, if it comes, the monsoon will be greeted with joy and celebrations. But the complex weather chain that brings precious rain to India can also bring misery. Rain which is every bit as predictable, but which is greeted with tears. The broad Mississippi Valley catches the rain from 41 states. When the river bursts its banks, there is nothing except homes in its way. This is what remains of Valmaya, the community rain destroyed. For the people of the Mississippi Valley, 1993 was the year of the $12 billion flood. 15 million acres disappeared under flood water. 
50 people died and 40,000 homes were destroyed. Like the Indian monsoon, the flood's causes lay thousands of miles away, warmer than average water in the Pacific, an exploding volcano in the Philippines, exceptionally high pressure over Bermuda. To the weathermen, the flood was no freak. It was not even unexpected. But for the people of the valley, it was devastating. Time after time, generation after generation, the floods that follow torrential rain have driven people here from their homes. Despite millions spent on flood control, the waters have returned to these communities again and again, seven times in this century alone. For everyone in Valmire, 1993 was the year that something uniquely precious was destroyed. Half the families in the town were descended from the Myers, who settled here a century ago. People like Audrey Reaver, her daughters Linda and Bobby. To them, Valmire was so secure, so special, that they never wanted to move away. We had this tremendous extended family, if you can say that, for a village of 700. We hadn't had a flood here since 1947. So we had this sublime sense of security, living on, on the floodplain, living in this beautiful valley, not ever worrying about what the river was going to do. Record rain for 122 days. By mid-July, with a hundred rivers bursting their banks, there was a state of emergency in nine states. But even when Valmire was evacuated, people refused to believe it could happen to them. I felt the day we moved out of the house that we'd be back, that we were just uprooting all our belongings, you know, and we'd come back and just have to put everything back in place. Uh, I just would never uh, admit to myself that, it, that something that devastating could happen. But during the night of August the 1st, the flood came submerging farms and homes, coating everything with stinking mud, spreading chemicals across fields and gardens and into homes. It was two weeks before Bobby could go back home for the first time. I think I was in shock, I guess, walking through and, and, and seeing that there just was nothing left. And I thought, God, how did my ancestors come back in and deal with this, you know. This, this is where my family lived before the flood. And um, we're standing in what used to be my dining room. And it was yellow. <laughs> because, I don't know, for some reason, um, that was kind of a favorite color of um, my grandmother and my dad and I made this room yellow. The people here have lost everything that they associated with daily life. Their post office, their gas station, their grocery store, their church, their school. Most Valmire families, including Bobby and her mother Audrey, won't be coming back. Their homes stand derelict, abandoned. They have moved away to where the rain and the river can't get them. I uh, keep telling myself that uh, I won't fall in love with the next house I live in, and I don't think that I will, <laughs> but um, a lot of people feel, you know, that they don't want to fall in love with where they're at anymore um, because it can be taken away from you. You can't predict the force of nature. Up until 93, I thought, you know, everything was cut and dried and you could, could control everything. But that really made me realize that uh, you don't have control over, over everything.
In Bombay, the longed-for rains have arrived at last, a full 40 days after they were expected. Rain is a gift, not a curse. In July, this may be the wettest city in the world. In 1991, 35 inches of rain fell in Bombay in just two days. And in Charapunji in the mountains, a world record. 90 feet of rain in one monsoon season. The city is transformed. The parched grounds where the students were playing cricket is suddenly an emerald bog where a woman can cut grass for her cow. At the weather office, they've at last got something to measure in the rain gauge. Mumtaz Karim, Chhatrawala to the Indian nation, is finally doing good business. The monsoon played truant this year. We almost wondered whether the monsoons would come or not. And I think I felt like a farmer looking at the sky, wondering when it would thunder and when the clouds would gather and become dark. We always bless grandfather-in-law for having thought of making umbrellas uh, because there'll always be rain and there'll always be umbrellas. Other things may have changed, but the umbrella is pretty much the same. In the shanty homes on Jula Maidan, a patchwork of plastic and timber is keeping the rain out, for now. Life here will get much more difficult during the three months of rain and mud and floods. But in spite of this, Samina and her mother-in-law can't hide their relief that at last the cooling rains have come. <laughs> <laughs> the monsoon is so much more than just rainy days in Bombay. Regular and predictable, it's the weather year's most dramatic piece of theatre. When fire and rain come together to give new life to half the world. But for Samina and all the people of Bombay, as for people everywhere, it's how the weather affects their daily lives that concerns them. We live our lives never thinking that our daily weather is just one small link in a vast interconnected system that circles the globe. Beautiful, destructive, without beginning or end. And set in motion day by day by the power of the sun.